the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. If it's difficult to find reason to smile, much less feel grateful these days, we might do so when we hear, smile. It makes people wonder what you're up to. Both smiling and gratefulness, it turns out, are good medicine. Clinical trials have demonstrated that gratefulness can lower blood pressure improve our immune function, and lead to better sleep. And couldn't we all use that? The English author G.K. Chesterton maintained that thanks are the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. That is today's challenge, the challenge and the gift of gratefulness. At this time, I'd like to thank our guest, our panelists, for this edition of Challenge 2.0 and begin with Rabbi Ted Falcon, who joins us again for this uh, edition of the program. He founded and led Bed Olive Meditative Synagogue in Seattle for 16 years. You retired in 2009, though I suspect you might admit retirement is a relative term. Holding a PhD in psychology, Rabbi Ted is one of the interfaith amigos, and that's a group with both openly examines the awkward parts of their individual faith traditions and also the great gifts that your individual faith traditions can offer separately and also together. Imam Jamal Rahman serves as the Muslim Sufi minister at Interfaith Community Sanctuary in Seattle. And you are one of Rabbi Ted's fellow three interfaith amigos, and you're also a repeat guest. I thank you for being patient enough to come back and join us again. It took a lot of courage, you know. It did. <laughs> yeah. It did, and I thank you for that. The amigos came together in the wake of 911 and have traveled widely throughout North America, the Middle East, and also Asia. Together they have authored three books, and I understand your first work is titled Getting to the Heart of Interfaith, the eye-opening, hope-filled friendship of a pastor, a rabbi, and an imam. Pastor Dave Brown has led the congregation at Emanuel Presbyterian Church in Tacoma since 2005, where you developed the innovative Blues Vespers, which sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, it is a lot of fun. No music today, though? No music today unless we decide to sing at the end. Right, right. Uh, okay. Did we'll you bring your harmonica? No. <laughs> it's always there. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can come up with one. Uh, and I understand that combines blues music with poetry and also reflection. Yes. Uh, Dave's gift for innovative thought and reflection led to an invitation to join Rabbi Ted and Imam Jamal uh, for their Pacific Northwest Interfaith Amigos program. So thank you each for joining us again today. Thank you. Thank you. I think as we spend much time, and maybe we try to avoid that at some level, uh, on what's called social media or the mass media, it seems the dominant themes are those of complaint and outrage. Uh, it brought to mind for me as I was preparing for this program uh, a Saturday Night Live routine in the 1980s featuring two characters named Doug and Wendy Weiner who spent most of their time doing just that. Has that become the norm in 21st century America? Have we become a nation of whiners? And we have learned to whine about our whining. <laughs> <coughs> uh, so we've raised it to a, an art form. I think we're learning that there's something about consciousness that tends to focus on the negative automatically. Ultimately, it's a survival mechanism of the ego identity, you know, that's always scanning for some kind of danger or some kind of threat. And we keep being presented with possibilities of those threats. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know from the news industry how, how the negative is featured. You know, we're drawn by stimulation of fear and stimulation of anxiety and stimulation of danger. Mm -hmm. And it becomes part of our process in growing to recognize that, to be conscious of that, and instead of automatically practicing our problems, to start practicing the solutions we see. Mm -hmm. I would say also that, uh, you know, we are whiners in the sense that we have <laughs> retreated into, I think, what we call uh, isolated and separate silos. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, black and white, rich and poor, uh, Republican, Democrat. And we sort of nurture our, our fears, our anger, 
And uh, we're not grateful for the diversity. Mm -hmm. We're unaware of that uh, wonderful peace and joy and fulfillment that can come if we really uh, practice compassion, uh, justice, and serve the common good. We end up just blaming the other. Mm -hmm. And I think we've bought into a view of the world as uh, built around scarcity. There's not enough. There's not enough goods for everybody. There's not enough love for everybody. Some religious people would say there's not enough of, of God's love for everybody, so you have to believe the right way in order to achieve that love. Mm -hmm. And I think this myth of scarcity, which in my tradition, Jesus challenges time and time again, then starts us whining about us not having enough in this world, rather than seeing abundance all around and seeing that there is enough if we share, and sometimes there's enough if we just open our eyes and, and notice what's around us. And certainly our consumer-based society, heightened by media, mm -hmm. I think reinforces that scarcity narrative that we need to get ours because there's not enough and we need to complain when we haven't gotten ours. Is this largely an outgrowth of the polarization that we've seen and is it relatively recent or has it been developing some steam for not just years but decades? What are, what's your take on that? Well, uh, I believe it's been happening for some time and the fact is, as I said earlier, we're simply not present to what we have. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the greatest problem human beings have is that uh, we are not grateful and we take things for granted. And the best way to overcome that, or one of the ways to overcome that is really to be grateful in the present moment for what we have, for our blessings. One of the, thing, <clears throat> one of the things that I've heard Imam Jamal say over the years had to do with looking at the countries that are judged to be the most happiest. Mm -hmm. you know, where the people are happiest. Mm -hmm. And they turn out not to be the most, uh, the richest or the most abundant uh, places. You know, right. often they are in Indonesia, they're, they're countries that actually have a lot of poverty and have a lot of difficulty, but the people have a sense of connectedness mm -hmm. to each other, families, interfamilies, you know, that just allows a deeper sense of meaning and a deeper sense of joy. That's a beautiful point you bring up. You know, I'm from Bangladesh and we have talked about I it. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I sorry, I'm <laughs> Bangladesh, yeah. But the reason I say that is because, you know, a few years ago, there was a survey going all over the world, mm -hmm. which is the happiest country mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. It was Bangladesh, it, an overcrowded country with lots of natural disasters. And the one reason they gave for this happiness is that they said the majority of people are grateful. Mm -hmm. And it is possibly because they pray a lot. And because they pray a lot, many of them have faith. And that faith enables them to be grateful uh, when things are very good. And when things are not bad, they know that uh, goodness will come around eventually. Mm -hmm. And another one of the countries that constantly charts high on that happiness survey is culturally very different than Bangladesh is Denmark. And Denmark, um, in a very socialistic way, makes sure that everybody's taken care of. Mm -hmm. So that scarcity assumption that drives some of the negativity and some of the fear in our context really isn't there when you live in a place where you know there will be enough health care for you, mm -hmm. where you know there will be enough education for you, where you know there will be enough time for you to go away on vacation. So that sense of scarcity in Denmark just isn't, isn't as real as it is here. As far as, is it the polarization? It's, it's so hard, isn't it, to unweave the factors that are making us who we are today. Mm -hmm. It's polarization and there's, there's media influences that information's in our face all the time. There's right. breakdown of intentional, spiritual and religious communities with all the surveys showing that fewer and fewer people gather with other people to nourish their soul. I mean, I can't decide what causes the whining, but, but there seems to be a myriad of directions we can point. There are a lot of different threads that have come yeah. out of what each of you have said. A question I'd like to ask you right now is, first of all, what is the cost of negativity individually to each of us when we really get caught up in that mindset? 
I actually think there have been considerable studies now, mm -hmm. both about the cost of negativity and the cost of uh, gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of physical health, in terms of emotional health, in terms of mental health, psychological health, it makes a great deal of difference and it seems to have an impact on the very nature of what happens to us in our lives. It's like consciousness has a habit of finding what it's looking for. Mm -hmm. And when our consciousness is looking for our problems or for what's wrong or for what's not quite right, that's actually what we see. And if we consciously start looking for, hey, you know, where's the beauty right now? Mm -hmm. where's, the, where's the gratitude right now? Where's, where is it? Where's the life right now? Rather than automatically, what's wrong now? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Buddha had this wonderful statement that, you know, we are what we think. Uh, everything that we are arises with our thoughts. So essentially, if I have negative thoughts, this leads to more negative thoughts. And it creates what the, the Islamic mystics say, uh, negative imaginary scenarios becomes a mantra situation in our mind and we have feelings of um, you know, anger and uh, fear and despair and these become exaggerated, we end up saying and doing things which we really regret. Which is why uh, it's a practice in all of our traditions, uh, in the, at the heart of the traditions, that when you have a negative thought, uh, do a spiritual intervention. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the East we say, neti neti, not real, not real, not this, not that. Uh, in Islam, we say toba toba, or you know, to those who are cyber savvy, uh, delete, delete, cancel, cancel. <laughs> <laughs> so we reduce that negative thought before it overwhelms us. And I think, especially what Rabbi Ted was saying earlier, our expectations so often create our reality. And if we're going through life looking for problems to solve, we're never going to see blessings to embrace. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in my religious household, the shift from original sin to looking at the original blessing of existence is what I feel a central shift that Christianity needs to make, and I'm not sure they will make, but the Celtic influence into the Christian household, which really focuses on the interweaving of, of the sacred and the secular and all that is holy with all that is, is, is flesh and mortal. And the problem that you're solving, if it is called a problem with religion and spirituality, is how can I embrace the blessingness of this life mm -hmm. where so much of dark Christian orthodoxy is the problem is how can I deal with the terrible sin within my life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those questions frame your religious and spiritual experience in radically different ways. And part of, I think, we try to do in each of our traditions is, is reframe the questions that um, our traditions and ask and the spirituality they nurture try to address. Mm -hmm. You know, there's one point <laughs> that Brother Ted always brings up, actually, uh, something which is at the heart of, again, every single tradition, that this is a world of contrasts. There is a world of <coughs> opposites. Like Rumi says, uh, the wonderful sage, that God turns you from one feeling to another. So you might have two wings to fly, not one. Mm -hmm. My point is, there'll be some negative thoughts. We'll have difficulties in our life. But can we be grateful for both, for the good times and the bad times? Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon me, he would say that, you know, when, when there was difficulty, affliction, he would say, oh God, please save me from its harm, mm -hmm. but please, do not deprive me of its good. And isn't that often the case that we grow, we expand ourselves, our perceptions of the world around us, what we can do from those negative experiences? Is that part of the foundation for gratitude out of those negative experiences? Yeah, I found one of the things I found as I was thinking about talking about gratitude and thankfulness is statements like, I'm thankful for the mess to clean after a party because it means I'm surrounded by friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thankful for the taxes I pay because it means that I am employed. I'm grateful for the clothes that fit a little too snug because it means I have enough to eat. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, talk about reframing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the challenge always is to 
find the blessings in the moment without denying the anguish or the pain. Mm -hmm. Because denial is, does not work as a defense mechanism. Um, so to acknowledge what's going on, but to understand it in a larger frame. As Imam Jamal was referring, um, it is the nature of our minds to know only through contrast. Mm -hmm. I can't know sweet without knowing bitter. I can't know up without knowing down. I can't know easy without knowing difficult. So it's the old thing. If everything went fine in our lives, we'd never know it. We only know it because of the contrast. So if we can get to a place of recognizing there's always going to be a contrast. I don't want to, I mean, there is, there is pain and there's, there's re the reasons that people feel negativity in their life that are, are tragic um, and are, are part of the injustices in our culture and our society that really are not redemptive, but are this part of, of the way that we're constituted right now that, that causes immense pain in some people's lives. Mm -hmm. But on the spiritual path, pain is part of that journey. The poet from Vermont, David Budbill, uh, has a short poem, and I'm not going to remember all of it when I turn to a certain birthday, my memory of pa power, mem memorization power for poems went away. But it ends, it's called Summer's Here, it's time to climb the peaks again and look down at the hawks from high places. And, um, and then it ends with the line, if you begrudge yourself some pain, you'll miss 10,000 peaks. Mm -hmm. And I think that poem is talking about if you really are, are working on relationship, on being vulnerable, on sharing the difficult parts of our traditions, there may be some pain on that spiritual journey. But that is where you get to those peaks um, where things seem clear and where you have a, a real transcendent experience. You know, Ruby has this wonderful poem which has become very popular now. You know, the dark thought, uh, the shame, the malice, uh, be grateful for be grateful for them. You know, greet them at the door, laughing because each one has be, has been sent as a guide from beyond. But there's one critical point here, which the mystics point out. Uh, for example, Rumi says, "Don't run towards pain and suffering and affliction. Just don't run away from them." That's the key. We've talked about the broad benefits of an orientation of gratefulness, of thanksgiving. What are your favorite personal examples? of gratefulness of thanksgiving. In, in uh, Jewish tradition, um, in a lot of ways, Jewish tradition is a path of blessing. Mm -hmm. it, it's somewhat different than a focus on prayer, you know, so that most of the day is filled with blessings. In fact, there's a tradition uh, that we are enjoined to say a hundred blessings a day. Now, one of the difficulties with any organized religion or any institution is that it tends to institutionalize those hundred blessings. Mm -hmm. So that if we go through the traditional prayer services each day, we will wind up doing a hundred blessings, which I think is unfortunate because to truly bless is to be aware and awake in the moment to the yeses and to the wows and to the oh yeah and mm -hmm. to the I'm so glad and to the I'm so grateful. And there's a helper and that is when you hear somebody saying a blessing, and I'm not talking just a traditional uh, language of blessing, but just the oh wows and the yeses, if you say amen, it counts as if it's one of your hundred blessings. So it's like an orientation that focuses us on, focuses me on, okay, when is the next blessing going to erupt in, mm -hmm. in my presence, in my world, in my life? And can I remember to note it and to say amen? A sense of expectation and receptivity then. Yeah. You know, I, I love the story of that fictional character named the mullah. Uh, through whom many truths are conveyed. So here's the story of the mullah who has lost his donkey. And that's a big deal in that part of the world. So the entire village tries to find the donkey and they cannot find the donkey. The donkey is lost forever. They come in the evening to give mullah the bad news. And where's the mullah? He's in the town square on his knees saying, Allah, thank you, thank you. I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful. So they say, mullah, maybe you haven't heard the bad news. 
your donkey is lost forever. He says, I know, I know, I know, but I'm so grateful because imagine what could have happened to me if I was on the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> so one insight is that even in times of affliction, mm -hmm. if you're expressing gratitude, we're giving thanks for unknown blessings already on their way. And that splashes in my heart. And, and I'll take a little different tact and a very personal story, and I have permission to share this, is um, recently a member of our community, Pat Flynn, was the mother of Relay for Life. Mm -hmm. And a marvelous, marvelous person. And she had some serious health problems the last year before she died in, in July. And um, she died with this immense sense of gratitude that touched everybody around her. She was able through much suffering to see the blessing of her life and all the gifts that she's been given and what was most important, her ability to serve as she led this effort to eradicate cancer. Mm -hmm. And being in that room, my wife and I, with this woman who knew she was gonna die the next day, there was a radiation and about joy. Um, and I said, well, how, Pat, how, how do you remember to be grateful? And she wasn't a journaler, but it's a very simple thing. Somebody in our parish gave her a bottle and a jar mm -hmm. and said, uh, as she was starting to get treatment, uh, every day put a thank you note in there. Uh, think of the gift of that day. And then as you're, if you're starting to feel your spirit wane, go back into your gratitude jar and remember the gifts you've had even in this time mm -hmm. when your body's gotten tired. And she said, so when I've gotten overwhelmed by what's happening in my body, the gratitude jar puts me back in touch with something larger. Mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful Pat Flynn, uh, wonderful story. So that suggests another question and that is, how difficult is it to change our focus from primarily being negative, paying attention to the negatives, to one of noticing the reasons for gratitude? And what suggestions, you mentioned one, what suggestions do you have practically for people, how they might achieve that? I think one of the things that we've discovered over the years of our working together is that deep change actually happens uh, through a more spiritual context and through a more spiritual consciousness. Um, willpower, like choosing, only works as long as we stay conscious. Mm -hmm. And we go unconscious all the time. I go unconscious, you know, so that somebody cuts me off on the freeway or somebody suddenly jolts in front of me or something, and I, I respond or I react in ways that are not totally conscious, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So, uh, the more spiritual process would involve taking a step back and being able to note how our minds work and what, how we're drawn to different aspects in our reality. And in consciousness, to start making a different choice so that it starts becoming automatic. Because unless it becomes automatic, there's no deep change, there's just what what one might call cosmetic change that only works when we remember, you know, like to put on that particular makeup or uh, that particular way of looking at the world. And we want to change something deeper. You know, I, I like uh, personally the practice of as often as possible, touching my heart mm -hmm. to express gratitude uh, to both God and to any person who is the cause for me to say thank you so much. So I just want to say that, you know, when we thank God, mm -hmm. uh, and the Quran says everything that exists uh, in the heavens and the earth uh, praises and thanks God. When we praise God, God is of, a, of the highest of the highest vibrations. Mm -hmm. So when we do this act of gratitude, it elevates and raises our vibrations in that higher direction. Mm -hmm. And then when I am thanking someone out of gratitude, I'm really having a soul connection with that person uh, because this is an attribute of the soul and I'm really at every moment I'm thanking someone I'm creating a soul-to-soul -soul bonding and this is what is critically needed in our times. Mm -hmm. and, and building a little bit on, on Brother Jamal's comments is one of the things gratitude does is it moves us away from 
this radical independence into a radical sense of interdependence. My mother taught me every night, she put her big hands around mine and we said what we were thankful for. She never realized she was teaching me something radical. She was really teaching me I needed other people, I needed the earth, I needed the soil. Uh, she was t really giving me a declaration of interdependence. And I think an interdependence, uh, well, would be an awareness of interdependence has a transforming power in our, in our world and, and in our culture. And sometimes for me to remember that, um, and sometimes my two brothers serve in this way, I need soul friends. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who um, I will say, I'm really starting to struggle with the negativity, uh, do you want to walk with me for a season? Um, that soul friend is a big part of the Celtic Christianity approach, but mm -hmm. find somebody, not a, maybe not a partner or a spouse, who um, you can be with every week and talk about your blessings and your struggles with your negativity. Um, spiritual advisors would be something like that. In sharing your perceptions, your wisdom about Thanksgiving, you've given us an additional reason to give thanks, I think, at this point. I hope you'll each come back and participate in Challenge 2.0 at some future time. And thank you for being a part of this today. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Challenge 2.0. We hope you'll join us again next week.